May we have such piety of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing God's will and no weakness keep us from doing it. Good morning. Good morning. Please join with me in opening your hymnal to hymn number 434, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Please rise for the singing of verses 1 and 2 only and remain standing for the prayer of invocation followed by all praying the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-loving God, we open our hearts and our minds for divine guidance that we may see God's will in everything that is playing out in our universe today. And may we look at what we have contributed and what we can learn as we embrace the rest of our soul's journey. May we truly desire to act in a way that we demonstrate our truth, that we may be the light that will give strength to others to stand for the truth, no matter what the circumstances, and to follow the dictates of their own individual hearts and minds, knowing that we each have responsibility for all that we set in motion, and whether we choose to act or not to act, there is also responsibility in those forms of decisions. And as we kneel at the altar of our own individual heart with our minds open, may we allow that unconditional love to flow through us to every individual that has the awareness to accept it. May we give it freely and include God's unconditional healing power that we may all rise to the occasion to see beyond our own personal needs, to accept the truth of our being and to move forward to be and let be knowing that whatever we act upon at the moment is divine order for the state of mind that we are in. And yes, we may need to face it again at some later date to make peace with and to know that God is and we are. Let us pray the prayer the master teacher Jesus taught to the original disciples affirming this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from error. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you and please be seated. Our scripture today comes from John chapter 2 verses 14 through 17. Our lecture is desire and zeal. Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who were buying oxen, sheep, and doves, and money changers sitting at tables. He made a whip of cord and drove them all out of the temple, even the sheep, the oxen, and the money changers. He threw out their exchange money and upset their trades that were placed upon the tables. To those who sold doves, he said, take these away from here. Do not make my father's house a house of trading. The disciples remembered that it is written, the zeal for thy house has given me courage. May Spirit bless the reading of the scripture. Desire goes before every act of our lives. The universal desire for achievement gives its mighty impulses to all things. Divine enthusiasm, zeal, is no respecter of persons or things. It moves to new forms of expression. 
even though some of them appear to be corrupt. It tints the cheeks of the innocent babe, gleams from the eye of the treacherous savage, and lights in purity the face of the saint. Zeal is the impulse to go forward. It is the urge behind every desire. To be without zeal is to be without the zest of life, the zest for living. Without zeal, stagnation, inertia, and death would prevail throughout the universe. The individual without zeal is like an engine without a source of power. Zeal alone is without intelligence, our discretion as to the results of what we set in action. Through these impulses, we create many states of consciousness that we ultimately tire of. They may have served a good purpose in their day in the grand scheme of creation, but as we catch sight of higher things, zeal urges us forward to their attainment. Zeal should always be tempered with wisdom to prevent it from becoming so active intellectually that it consumes one's vitality leaving nothing for spiritual growth. Many enthusiastic spiritual workers have let their zeal to demonstrate truth to others rob them of the power to demonstrate that very truth to the people around them. Some people get so fired up with zeal when they first tackle a job that they quickly grow tired and eventually get fired from every job they tackle. One may even become so zealous for the spread of truth as to bring on nervous prostration. We should use a portion of our zeal to do God's will, establishing the kingdom of God within us, taking time to be holy, to do our own spiritual work. Reverend Gladys Strom, a wonderful person, a great medium and teacher, shared many personal events with her students. From the stories she shared, it was evident. She applied this to her life. One day she came to class with a big smile on her face and a piece of paper in her hand. She asked the class <laughs> if we knew what it took to truly be a good metaphysician. Then she moved forward and shared with us what her guide Silverwing had given to her in meditation. She said to be a good metaphysician, we should have the desire to get religion like a Methodist, experience it like a Baptist, stick to it like a Lutheran, pray for it like a Presbyterian, glorify it like a Jew, be proud of it like an Episcopalian, propagate it like a Catholic, Practice it like a Christian scientist. Work for it like the Salvation Army. Sing for it like a Nazarene. Shout for it like a Pentecostal. Love it like a Quaker. And enjoy it like a Holy Roller. Well, you would only have to know Reverend Gladys to find that very humorous. So, she observed the class before she spoke, saying, it is my responsibility not only to teach you metaphysics, but also to inspire you to be a good metaphysician using what works for you at the time. So she's saying, take the truth that you come into contact with wherever it may be, and don't be afraid or ashamed to look at others that are putting forth their truth and are very enthusiastic about it. So as metaphysicians, sometimes I think we become a little less enthusiastic than other denominations because we have that communication that we can rely on and sometimes I think we rely on it a bit much. We need to get back into feeling because feeling is part of being and being is knowing and doing. 
One of our greatest challenges will be to have the awareness when things are no longer appropriate for us. Never stop challenging ourselves to grow spiritually, always keeping in mind that we alone create our thoughts and only we choose our actions. There may be times when we feel that we have no options, but only because we will not allow ourselves to see the other potential possibilities to choose from. We can unlock the doors of our mental prison by being big enough to honestly admit all of our shortcomings. Brilliant enough to accept praise without becoming arrogant. Tall enough to tower above deceit. Strong enough to welcome criticism. Compassionate enough to understand human frailties. Wise enough to recognize our own mistakes. Humble enough to appreciate greatness. Staunch enough to stand by our friends. Human enough to be thoughtful of our neighbor. And righteous enough to be devoted to the love of God within our own selves. We may never be as strong, courageous, brilliant, wise, or charming as some people may be. But when we do our best, we can lie down at night and rest, knowing it will have been enough. To rest is to be at peace, to be tranquil, or to remain unchanged. Metaphysically, Jerusalem means habitation or place of peace. In humanity, it is the abiding consciousness of continuous realization of spiritual power, tempered with spiritual poise and confidence. It is an inward journey and explains why Jesus went up, not down, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is actually located over a hundred miles south of Cana, and history has proven that the temple Jesus spoke of was the physical body, a symbol of his own inner being. Every person is a high priest in his or her own consciousness, but to what level has that priest ascended? When we speak or hear Jehovah, our God, is in his holy temple. Do not think we are, do not think of God as dwelling in external things. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19 states, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? When we broaden our consciousness by going deeper into the mysteries of being, our temples become more magnificent. Spiritual thought and meditation constantly carry us to places of higher ascension, where form is resolved into divine idea. This is the supreme victory of Jesus the Christ when he came proclaiming that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, anointing him to open, his, open the eyes of the blind. He spoke of the spiritual eyes of humanity, not those who were without vision to see the things in the world. Jesus was in constant communication with Christ's mind. He had an insight into human nature that appears infallible. Realizing this helps us understand some of the strangeness of many of his conversations recorded in the Gospels. Jesus did not always respond to the words people spoke. He responded to what he read in their hearts and minds. To the literal-minded people, it appears that he is not answering the questions asked of him, but in the context of who he is, Jesus, our spiritual awareness, is answering the questions that he reads and the souls of the individuals, giving to them the guidance and the information 
not merely at the level that things were spoken from their lips. Many times as we sit in prayer or meditation, we send forth our question with the assumption that the response will be literal, as clear as a nose on our individual face. When divine mind does not respond the way we ex expect, we conclude that our prayer was not answered because we don't yet have the ears to hear or the eyes to see that which comes from higher levels of consciousness. It behooves us to understand that our physical body is a living temple of God and is a symbol of our inner being. Animals represent unnecessary emotions. Money changers and sellers symbolize materialistic activities and a sense of wrong values. The consciousness must be cleansed of these emotions and values if the body temple is to be kept pure and holy. As metaphysicians, we understand that Jesus is demonstrating an important corrective purifying process, which is beneficial to all of humanity. The power of spiritual awareness, Jesus, uses the power of denial, symbolized as a whip of cords, which results in the letting go or driving out of the unnecessary and troublesome factors in consciousness. The fact that Jesus made a whip of cords indicates some passage of time, which negates the idea of Jesus acting in hot anger, but rather he is giving a demonstration that we can use renunciary energy to eliminate that which should be eliminated by each and every one of us. The 12 disciples represent the 12 faculties of mind in humanity. Spiritual awareness sees the futility of struggling with temporal things and directs the energy to work on external things. The scattered faculties are drawn together and brought into recognition of the master. The I am, this is the inner interpretation of Jesus calling his disciples forth. When given the master key, all the rusty padlocks of the mind are open wide and all the closed windows and doors open to the sunny light of day and the sweet freshness of awareness, understanding and freedom rush in. Then our disciples remember that it is written, the zeal for thy house has given me courage as stated in John 2, 17. When the mind is focused on materiality, its objects and aims, our faculties are not developed along permanent lines. Truth reveals to us that every faculty must be used to spiritual ends. Then our zeal, the desire to move forward, allows our faculties to remember, giving us the courage to call forth our disciples and to assemble them together in order that the law of being may be fulfilled in our lives. If you remember, Jesus himself said, I come not to break the law, but to fulfill. If Jesus has this as a responsibility, then to truly walk and awaken the Christ consciousness within us, we must know that we have to fulfill that law as well. So therefore, if for no other reason, it would behoove us to keep our thoughts high, to keep our actions pure, to determine that we do not make our Father's house, that temple, a house of trading. May Spirit bless you.